Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Now this series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and if you've been on before, you know that stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now during the month of March, the NOAA Heritage Program is helping us take you behind the scenes at six different NOAA facilities during our NOAA Open House series. We will travel virtually, of course, across the country to showcase some of the amazing places where our scientists, engineers, educators, technicians, and interns work. And today, it is going to be my pleasure to take you to NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center in Lakeland, Florida. Now, while we'll be talking about NOAA's aircraft fleet, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that our speakers today are coming to us from the lands of the Seminole, and we are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedaquina. Now, just a few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write your questions. Please let us know if you're a class tuning in and who is specifically in the class asking the question. We encourage you to write them in the box. I will keep track and our speakers will stop every now and then to answer a few. We might not get to all of your questions, but we will try to answer as many of them as possible. All right, enough of me talking. I know you're ready for the tour. So I'm gonna at this point welcome Jonathan on and he is going to be taking us on our behind the scenes virtual tour and I will see you at the end. Hello everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, Grace introduced me, I'm Jonathan Shannon. I am the Public Affairs Specialist for NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center, and here's me as a kid. Uh, I have always been interested in the ocean from an early age, uh, thanks to Jacques Cousteau, even though I was living in West Virginia, um, and I love being able to talk about NOAA's important missions, uh, whether it's from the aircraft, or previously I was with uh, the NOAA Fisheries Service doing work with the Office of Protective Resources, or as I like to joke, all the ones you don't want to catch, protecting the marine mammals and the endangered species in our ocean. So I am going to zoom us over to the Aircraft Operations Center. So welcome to NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center here in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, just giving you a little bit of sunshine and palm trees for everybody who is in places not as warm and sunny as we are. And we are going to, oops. Yeah, we are going to go talk a little bit about our home in Lakeland, Florida. So as you can see on the left-hand side here, I'm gonna use my mouse. This is our um, aircraft operations center offices. And then the back there is our hangar. Um, we uh, come to our home in 2017, and we've also just signed a, a longer term lease and expanded, uh, gonna be here for another 20 years uh, and welcome some more aircraft to our fleet. So we have about 110 employees at the Aircraft Operations Center, which includes NOAA Corps officers, they're pilots and navigators. It's one of the eight uniformed services uh, for the United States. And we are, our, our NOAA Corps officers fly our planes and also uh, they drive our ships for NOAA science. Um, we just have the pilots at the Aircraft Operations Center. We all work as a team uh, to support our aircraft and the, the science missions from the different uh, NOAA lines. So in addition to our NOAA Corps officers, we have civilians, we have our uh, meteorologists, technicians, mechanics, engineers, and support staff like me uh, as a public affairs officer uh, or a financial specialist or, or administrative specialist that get our aircraft where they need to go, when they need to be there, fueled up and ready to do our missions. So we have several kinds of aircraft, and just like the, the varied people on our team, we have varied uh, jobs for these aircraft. So we do a variety of missions. We do low-level surveys, from low-level surveys to high-altitude um, missions, uh, high-altitude atmospheric research missions with our 
jet operating the Gulf Stream 4. So we have on the NOAA Live website, we have some in-depth uh, guided tours of our Twin Otter over here, our King Air down here, our WP3D Orion, and our Gulf Stream 4 jet. Uh, this one in the middle here is our uh, Gulf Stream Turbo Commander. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit more about them later throughout this, uh, this presentation, but check out those uh, videos for some more in-depth information. So right now, we're gonna, I'm going to take you inside the Aircraft Operations Center. And we're going to go and speak um, in our calibration lab to Mr. Jorge Delgado, who runs that lab. And calibration is very important to our mission. So calibration means to test your, your sensors and your equipment to make sure it's measuring accurately, right? So say, for example, you have a thermometer at your house and uh, you want to make sure it's reading accurately. So if it's two degrees off, you may think you have a fever when you do, actually don't. So it's very important for us to make sure we have accurate readings when we fly in our planes into wherever we're flying, whether it's a hurricane or an upper altitude mission. And Jorge is going to show us a really interesting piece of equipment called our cloud physics. Welcome to the calibration lab here at NOAA Aircraft Operation Center. In this lab, we do all the calibration and testing of all the sensors that go in the aircraft, uh, especially on the P3s and on the G4 for all the hurricane missions and for all the projects that we do the, during the year. Uh, this is an example of some of the instruments that goes in the aircraft. It's the Cloud Physics probe uh, made by DMT. Uh, they actually got laser beams that go across and they measure different particles from very small sizes, like on that one, a slightly bigger size of particles on this one to a little bit precipitation size droplets. Also the snowflakes, you know, you get a 2D image and all that get recorded in the aircraft, also with accounting how many particles were encountered while we're flying through the atmosphere. Right, so um, that was a really neat, uh, neat instrument that Jorge uh, showed us. So I want to ask you guys, why do you think um, it's important, or why are we interested in understanding more about the the particle or droplet size with these uh, lasers that are that are measuring those sizes on these cloud physics probes? What 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 makes us interested in that that particle or droplet size? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. So just to um, say Jonathan's question again, and remember you can write your answer in the chat box, is why do we measure what particles are up there or what size they are? Does anyone know why is that important? And Audrey says maybe it gives us information on the hurricane intensity. Any other guesses why it's important to measure um, what particles are there and what size they are? Um, Alice and Paul say it lets us know if it's hail or rain. Hannah says it, it just gives us information. Jonas, Jonas says to predict precipitation. Alan says how much water is available. And um, Theodore thinks maybe it's to measure how big the storm is. So I think those are our guesses. Well, that's great. Yeah, as you're looking at it, it, it does give us a lot of that information. So what we want to know about is how big the, the particles are, because that affects what size of clouds are developing. Um, you're seeing as we're doing a walkthrough of the, of the calibration lab real quick, and we're gonna go back to this, this device here, and I'll pause it real for a second. So as we're looking at the different sizes of particles, it helps us understand what gas is in the atmosphere, um, when clouds form, and also within the clouds, what type of precipitation is it developing? So those are really good answers. And we don't only do hurricane missions, we also do atmospheric science missions where we're trying to figure out what gases or what pollution is in the atmosphere, as well as experiments to try and figure out how clouds form in the first place. So it's a really important instrument for that. So making sure it's calibrated is a big job. Um, so we're, we're looking at the different laser beams, the sizes of that. Uh, earlier, you saw those tubes in, in the rack there. Those are our drop signs that we drop out of the aircraft, the P3 and the Gulfstream 4. Uh, it's important those are calibrated, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. But what we look at is we're look, 
looking at measuring pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, all sorts of different sensors on the aircraft. So um, here this, this gray thing is a temperature bath where we can take the, the instruments through all sorts of the temperatures that we go into and we, we test all of those things um, on the ground before we take it into the airplane. So I'm going to stop here real quick, uh, Grace, if you get some questions from the audience before we move on uh, out of the calibration lab to our fabrication lab. Okay, so this is Grace from the chat box. So if you have any questions about those instruments we saw or anything Jonathan shared, and one question that did come in um, while others might be thinking of ones they want to put in there, Hunter asks, because you showed us those different aircraft, what's your favorite aircraft? Oh, that's a good question, Hunter. Um, well, I, I love all my children, but um, the, the Twin Otter I really like a lot because it's, it's so versatile. It does a lot of our, our missions, and you'll, you'll get a walkthrough of that with Kenneth. Um, I also like the, the, the P3 uh, just because of the, that it goes straight into the hurricane, and it does a lot of other uh, missions as well for us. So those would be my two favorites. And then another question comes in, and this is a um, this is a great question that comes in usually when we show equipment. Charter's asking, how much do the measuring um, instruments cost? So are they very expensive? Well, that's a good question. So it depends. Um, sometimes we have specialized instruments that people bring to us from universities um, that we we check before, or other times we have um, items off the shelf. One one thing I do know the actual cost on are those drop signs. It's about uh, $800 a drop sound um, as we drop them out, uh, and they are expendable, so we don't get them back. But it is very important as we're doing our hurricane forecasting mission. Um, each one of those drop zones provides invaluable information to help protect people and get them out of harm's way when a hurricane's coming their way. Okay, one last question before you move on. Diana asks, what happens if the instruments are wrong? Who fixes them if they get broken? That's also a great question. So if the instruments are wrong, uh, we can either send them to the manufacturer to get them recalibrated, or we can work with our um, engineers on site uh, to work with it. Maybe it's it's a software fix, you know, uh, figuring out what that offset is from what the instrument is measuring in our controlled environment to um, what we are trying to get it to measure. So we can take into account that difference as the data comes in, or we can uh, send it off to the manufacturer or, or try and fix it in-house. Perfect, now I'm gonna hold on to the rest of the questions because I know you have more to show us. So back to you, Jonathan. All right, we are gonna go into the um, fabrication lab here uh, and down. How are you doing? Um, welcome to the uh, fabrication shop here at NOAA AOC in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, my name is Edgar Serrano. I'm one of a team of four aerospace engineering technicians. And uh, please follow me and I can give you an introduction to our shop here. Okay, so as we're going back into the fabrication lab, one question I have for the audience is, you know, why do we have a fabrication lab? Um, why, do you, why do we need one at our aircraft operations center? Okay, so this is Grace in the chat box. Another question for you, and please write in that box. Why do you think they have to have a fabrication lab? Why do they have this um, shop with all these machines? What do you think? Let's see, so Audrey says to repair things. Brenna says um, you need one for repairs or maybe refitting. Um, Alice and Paul say, so you don't have to ship the parts away to be made. You can make them right there. Audrey says quick turnaround for things that you maybe can't go buy at the store or get off the shelf. Beatrix says, because um, all the instruments that you might need to fix and Michelle says the same thing. And um, let's see, Hannah says tool making and I think Last one, Jet says, is a workshop for your in-house engineers. So I think that's a good list. I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I just want to know, has everybody been on this tour before? Uh, I don't remember seeing you, but um, that is exactly right. We have a variety of equipment here to bend, cut, shape metal. Um, these are helping us to do both custom designs uh, to, and also to protect our off-the-shelf sensors, as well as install sensors and instruments 
that researchers develop and, and test. So we've got hole punches, we've got um, metal bending, metal shearing, uh, metal stretching. Uh, we've, we've got all sorts of different um, tools. So in the back corner here is one of our um, interesting tools. You get to see it real quick right now. This is our water jet table. Uh, it can produce up to 60,000 pounds per square inch of cutting uh, ability as, as, as it's got um, using both sand and water. And we're able to upload a design for the computer for some precise cutting and shapes. So um, Edgar here is gonna show us a couple of the products that were built out of it. So not only can we work in metal and do very fine cuts, but we can also do things like these laptop holders. So when we get into the aircraft uh, to keep them stable, we also do structures outside of the aircraft. Uh, these are custom made barf bag holders for the uh, P3 when it gets bumpy in the hurricane there. And then we also have um, larger pieces that we can attach to our aircraft in order to deploy um, chutes and tubes outside of it because we're doing different missions than what the aircraft was designed for. And then we also have um, able to cut into foam for our tool control program, which is very important when you're working around aircraft to be able to make sure you know where all your tools are. Um, you don't want them to fall into an engine or be loose in the aircraft when we go through some turbulence. So I'm gonna show you real quick this water uh, jet demonstration um, with some sound here. I'm going to speak a little bit over the, the sound, but you can see we've uploaded an image into the computer file, and then the water jet cuts it all out automatically, so it follows the pattern, and we'll see what we come up with here. Just as a reminder, Jonathan, right now it's shooting out water and sand to cut. Is that correct? Yes, it's shooting out a combination of water and sand in order to cut through this quarter inch uh, piece of aluminum in order to create the design that was uploaded on the computer. So, um, I'm going to stop here after that cool demo and see if we have any other audience questions about our fabrication lab or anything we've uh, already covered. Grace? Okay, so this is um, Grace from the chat box. And one of the questions that came in is Jet's wondering if any of the parts you make are 3D printed. That's a good question, Jet. Um, so in a way, I don't think we have a 3D printer at the shop, but this um, this water jet table can do some some really complicated cuts, uh, like you saw uh, those those fart bags and other things. But I don't think we have a 3D printer uh, currently. But that's a great question. Great. And while I ask these questions, Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind going back just to your presentation um, away yep. from the video, that'd be perfect. So um, another so. I think a question about that cutter that you showed at the end, if you could just um, say again what you said when all the sound was going on, that it's following a design you designed on your computer. If you could just tell them that again, I think there was some confusion. Yeah, that's right. So the there's a software, a computer attached to the cutter, and we we work with our aerospace engineers and the, the, the technicians in the, the metal shop to design uh, exactly what we need based on the tolerances that it's going to go through. So like if it, um, the, the force and the shear it might expect in a hurricane or, or on the Twin Otter. Uh, and then that pattern that's on the computer is, is cut out by the, by the water jet. Great. And Jody's wondering, do you know how, how many machines are there in the lab? Um, there are a lot. I have, I didn't count them all, um, but uh, trying to go back through, I think we have at least 20, um, possibly 30 machines, but we also have a paint booth that you didn't see uh, where it does powder coating and, and helping to um, paint over the, the items we make. Uh, and there's also a, a, a Gerber machine that makes the decals that you see. So uh, when you see the, the Kermit and Piggy stickers we, we make those for our aircraft as well as the, the hurricane um, that we go through in the aircraft 
Excellent. And Charter asked, last question, what's the biggest thing you've cut with the water jet? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it would have to fit on the table. So I don't think we've cut anything bigger than the table. Uh, they were working on a tub uh, that would go in the Twin Otter in order to protect uh, some cameras that, that are used for coastal mapping and uh, emergency response afterwards. So they cut a tub for that to put it on both the Twin Otter and the King Air. Um, but that's the biggest I can think of. Great. All right. Well, like I said, we have a very inquisitive bunch, so I love the questions, but I know you have a lot to share. So I'm going to uh, hand it back to you, Jonathan, to continue on the tour. Great. Uh, and I'm actually going to um, hand hand off to Kenneth, uh, our Ensign Kenneth Brewer, our pilot. I hope he is, is ready to go. Uh, and Grace, can you help me with the changing of the presenter? Absolutely. Here comes Kenneth. Great. Thank you, everybody. Are you all, all right. set, Kenneth? I think I'm all set. Can everyone see me? Yes. Okay, good. Hi, my name is my name is Kenneth. It's K-E-N-N-I-E-T-H. My call sign or nickname is Blue. It's B-L-U-E, or just Blue. Uh, either one is perfectly fine by me. Y'all can see this is me whenever I was in my, uh, back in my movie star years, whenever I was trying to get the job with uh, the filmers of Top Gun. And... Uh, Tom Cruise got the part. I didn't, but I'm not bitter about it. I've always wanted to be a pilot ever since I was y'all's age. You can see I'm sitting there in my bomber jacket. It uh, it's still. Okay, so I hate to stop you, but we don't see your slides. We just see a white oh, screen. My. Okay, hold on. Let me fix that for you. I don't think I depressed the button hard enough. There we go. There, there. Oh, no. now you're in your bomber jacket. We see you. Okay, now you can see me. Now you know what I'm talking about. Not just the bobbling head in the corner. All right, very cool. So there's my picture. Whenever I was y'all's age, I always wanted to be a pilot and I've finally been blessed enough to become one. So it's super cool. Now, let's take a look at our hangar. All right, so this is it. As we're coming through the hangar doors, you see just how big that hallway is. And that's so we can actually take some of the engines down this hallway and into the mechanic shops if they need to have a better look at it. Right here, we have our NOAA Twin Otter. As we pan, you'll see the P3 is in the corner. That's Kermit over there. And then as we pan back, you'll see that we have the King Air and another Twin Otter out there. This is gonna be a beautiful slow, uh, slow pan right here. That is our jet. That is a Gulfstream G4. Usually used as a business jet, but we use it for science. Again, we have our P3 back there in the corner. You can see an engine out in front of it. It's cordoned off because we're actually doing maintenance on it. And then we have our King Air right there. And as we end, we're gonna end on Jonathan and I's favorite plane in the fleet, the NOAA Twin Otter. All right, very cool. Now we're gonna go back to my PowerPoint here. Let's see where we can pick up. So we divide our fleet into light aircraft and heavy aircraft. So the light aircraft, we actually have the Twin Otter, which does low-level surveys. So that's coastal mapping, uh, well research, seals and sea lions, and also snow, snow survey or coastal mapping. Um, and then we have our King Air as well, and we do emergency response and coastal mapping with that aircraft as well. That's the second one down uh, on the photo line. And then we also have what is called the Turbo Commander. The Turbo Commander is probably the most powerful uh, light aircraft uh, that we have and it is actually going on its sundown tour. It was primarily used for snow survey, but it is being retired this year and being replaced with a second King Air. So we're very excited. We've got a brand new ER, or excuse me, 350 ER. Uh, it's a 2020 model. So it has all the bells and whistles that we need. And we're super excited about that. With that, we will uh, also do a quick walkthrough of my favorite airplane the NOAA Twin Otter. All right, so this is my big, beautiful airplane. As you can see, it has front doors, so I don't have to walk through all the passengers whenever I'm getting in. It sits up really, really high, and that allows us to land on unimproved payments, the pavements, if we were ever 
uh, needing to land on grass or gravel or rocks. As you can see, it has a humongous cargo door, and we actually have it set up to do coastal mapping, so it has that very large camera. It's probably bigger than anybody's camera that you've ever seen. So we mount that inside the airplane, and we're able to take pictures. As we come around, that's our emergency exit there. As we come around, there's this big tank on the left. That is actually our auxiliary fuel tank. We can hold another 185 gallons of fuel, giving us approximately an extra two, two and a half hours of fuel. I, uh, I'm moving past the big terminal there where the computer systems are handled. These two seats are for the computer operators that actually control the uh, cameras in the back. And then you can see those big bubble windows that we can see out of. The bubble windows actually come in handy whenever we are doing uh, well surveys. And you can see there's a few tick marks right there on the window. And those are set up at 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees. And whenever the scientists actually have their heads kind of looking out the window, they can say, oh, I have a sighting at 50 degrees on the starboard side or the port side. And then that will tell us because we know that we're at a thousand feet and they know what the angular distance is. And they'll say, oh, it's two miles to the left or two miles to the right. All right, and there's their work desk that they can put up their little laptops and such. You can see some of our safety equipment down there on the left. And then we're coming into my office. It's small, but the views are terrific. Up there, we have our throttles and props and mixture controls or fuel shutoff controls, the fire handles, the engine instruments. And you can see we have an all glass cockpit that is all up to date, brand new equipment up front. So we have very, very good equipment inside those airplanes. Down here, we have our satellite phone and our Wolfsburg radios to where we can talk to ships. And then we're back up at the throttle quadrant. Now it's interesting because the throttles are up top, so we actually have to hang our arm up like that the whole time we're flying. Those are all of our circuit breakers and one of our headsets there. And the circuit breakers just help us put stuff online or offline if it's damaged. And then that is our beautiful cockpit. And then we were gonna move back. Let's take a look at Edgar now. Y'all were in the shop with Edgar earlier. Um, now we're actually going to take a look at what we do with the elements that he builds and how we mount them in the Okay, now we're out on the hangar floor. Um, we have one of our twin otters here in the background. And we'll get to show you how we incorporate what we do in the shop, how it transitions over to the aircraft. These are two of the panels that were cut out on that water jet you've seen um, in efforts to build what's called a drop chute for our otters. This right here gets installed on our otters like so and we will drop scientific buoys to get our readings and measurements and as you can see that's the way it sits on the aircraft okay now we're out on the hangar floor Very cool. All right, Grace, I know we have to have some questions by now. I'm going to start switching over, but what questions do we have? Absolutely. This is Grace from the chat box, and I've been keeping track. So let's see. Uh, first question, CB asks, are you qualified to, to fly all of the aircraft? That is a very good question, CB. I am primarily an otter pilot, but most of our pilots fly two to three of the aircraft. Um, I am looking at the other airframes of which I want to fly, and hopefully I'll be picked up. But right now I only fly, fly one, but it's very common for us to fly two or three different types. And Samantha wonders how many people fit in the plane. So I'm going to ask you to just answer that right now for the Twin Otter, because that's what we just saw. Very cool. Yes. So for the Twin Otter, we could fit up to 20 people in the airplane, but we usually only carry about four to six. Uh, that's that's a usual uh, load for us. And Jonas is wondering, do you ever get those drop things back? So the things that you're dropping out, do you ever get them back? No, so we usually don't. They usually just disintegrate in the ocean um, and they don't really hurt anything. They just kind of go to the wayside. But no, we don't usually get them back. They usually, they're pretty heavy. They sink to the bottom pretty quick. And um, 
I don't know if you already said this, but Stephen is wondering why the twin otter is your favorite because Jonathan also said the twin otter was his favorite. So what, what do you love so much about it? So I love it because we get to do the best mission. We fly, instead of flying at 8,000 or 10,000 or 45,000 feet, we're at 500 feet to 1,000 feet. So we're very low. We get to travel all over the United States and the world in this airplane, and we get to see everything. Whenever you're flying in an airliner at 30,000 feet, you don't see much, but if you're at 500 feet, you get to see everything. And that's what I love about it. I can see the whales. I can see their families. Uh, whenever we pass, you can see all the seals and sea lions. I can look at huge uh, ice formations inside the rivers and the oceans. Uh, in Lake Superior, I can go down and see what the ice looks like. You can see people fishing, they wave at you. So that's what I love about it. We're really low and slow and good to go. All right, and then Alice and Paul, and also um, Hunter was wondering one of the same things. On average, how many, um, how long can you go out? You mentioned that you could go two and a half hours longer, but how long can you fly? That is an outstanding question. So we can usually fly, our range is approximately eight to 900 uh, nautical miles. And then we, that's usually about six hours of fuel that we could actually carry on board if we needed to. Um, and we can, we can push that out even further if we really needed to, but about four to six hours is an average flight. So we'll go up, we'll fly for about six hours, come back, have lunch, refuel, and go back out and uh, finish up our mission. So we can be up there a long time. Usually we spend more time in the air than on the ground. Great. Okay. And uh, I have one more question for you, but before I get to that, I just want to share with, because we're getting some questions. Um, Afton was asking about your flights on animal research missions. So I just wanted to tell Afton, one of our early NOAA Live webinars was aerial surveys of right whales. So I encourage you to watch that because that will answer some of your questions. Jonas wonders why we need to map um, the coastline. Again, we've done some coastal mapping uh, webinars, so I encourage you to look through the NOAA Live uh, playlist and take a look at that. And Kenneth, this question is for you, and then I'm going to um, encourage you to go on. But this comes from James. What training or studies would the students need to do to get a job like yours? Absolutely. Those are very good questions. Um, so training and preparing for this job. So if you're interested in aviation, start learning now. Get hands on with one of the local clubs, go down to one of the local airports and see what's going on. Get involved. Um, young Eagles is a great way to do that for young people to get involved in aviation. And you want to be very good at science. So study biology, study chemistry, study physics, and then start to work on your pilot's license if you're able, uh, whenever you're in high school. You can actually learn to fly whenever you're 15 years old. So you can learn pretty pretty early in life. And then if it's something you're interested in, make sure you study hard in those STEM fields, math, science, tech, and technology, and uh, go into an aviation uh, degree or an engineering degree. Those would both be really, really good. Great, all right, well, I'm gonna hold on to the rest of the questions because we wanna see more. So back to you, Kenneth. Awesome, all right, now we're gonna go into our heavy aircraft here. All right, oh, sorry if you hear my dog. All right, so this is our P-3 Orion. This is our Hurricane Hunter aircraft. We have two of those, and they're the ones that actually fly into the storm. We don't fly over it, we don't fly above it and then drop down, we fly straight through the storm. And that's how we are able to gather that data. We have two of them. Their names are Kermit and Miss Piggy. Kermit is the oldest, and then there's Miss Piggy. And that is our nose art that's on both the airplanes down there at the bottom of the screen, you can see. And that's actually from the Jim Henson Corporation. So let's look inside, or excuse me, on the outside of our P3. All right, in just one moment. This is actually a shot of the uh, bottom of the airplane. We didn't jump too far ahead, and that is actually uh, the camera down there. All right, very cool. Here's the walk around. We got that nose radar up there, and then we have that big round peanut at the bottom, or M&M &M at the bottom. That's our chin radar. 
and then we have that science probe that you saw hanging off the left wing. That is our TDR, or yeah, uh, Tell Doppler radar, TDR. <laughs> and that's a Doppler radar that's in the back of the airplane that we can start to cut through the storm and take a look at it. And you can see just how big it is. And this aircraft holds about 20 people on an average flight. And then as we're doing this, we can actually walk um, through the airplane here in just a minute. But let's go back and talk about some of the other aircraft. All right, this is our other heavy aircraft. So we're able to kind of look at the outside of that P3 real quick. This is our other heavy aircraft that you all saw earlier, the Gulfstream G4, and it does high altitude. And to give you an idea of what we mean by high altitude, an average airliner, so an airliner that you would take from New York to California or New York to Florida or wherever, uh, flies at about 30,000 feet. We fly 45,000 feet, up to 45,000 feet. So we do a lot of high atmospheric storms. Now the P3 goes through the actual hurricane, but the G4, because of its range, is able to go out and around the storm because we need to look at what's going on in the bigger realm of things. So if you look at a storm, we want to know what's going on around the storm to predict how that storm might move uh, in the water and onto whatever coast it might hit. And to give you an idea of how far this aircraft can actually fly, the P3 actually flies about 2,000 kilometers, which is roughly from, or 2,000 nautical miles, so roughly from New York to London. The G4, however, can fly from New York all the way to Moscow, Russia. So very, very, very far uh, distance. We could circumnavigate all of the entire uh, Gulf of Mexico in one single flight in a basic eight hour mission. And it is known as Gonzo. And that is because of its funny long nose that it has. It has an extra long nose to do that C band or to house that C band radar that we have up there. And this is a beautiful picture of it in Lakeland coming off of a mission. You can see those storm clouds starting to form. And that is the TDR, that big tail. Uh, that's on the back of the actual airplane. And then you can kind of see its funny nose. And you'll see it's very slick. There's not much hanging off of this airplane because it can go very fast. When I mean very fast, I'm talking Mach 0.8. So if Mach is the speed of sound, it's going 0.8. So just two notches, just slower uh, than the speed of sound. So it's moving very, very fast if it needs to. All right. Very cool. Do we have any questions about that before we go into the flying laboratory here? Oh, Kenneth, there are always questions. This is great. Let's, uh, take all, let's take some. Were there Theodore Wonders, were there beds on the P3? Theodore, that is a great question. A man after my own heart, already thinking about sleeping. I absolutely have beds on that P3. There's actually three beds, and that's because we take multiple crews. And by crew, I mean flight crew. So there could be up to five pilots on that plane. And that's because you're only gonna get three or four good passes before you are absolutely exhausted. So you'll go back, you'll, you'll let the other pilots come forward and take over uh, whenever we break out of the storm. You'll go back, take a nap for a few passes, um, and then you'll go back up and finish out the flight. So absolutely we have beds. We can circumnavigate the world if we needed to in that plane. So you gotta have a, a kitchen and a bed. What else awesome. do you have? And Beatrice was wondering, have you ever been in a dangerous situation in a storm? There has been a few dangerous situations, but we take every precaution uh, to make sure that we mitigate those risks or try to make those risks not happen. Um, so there has been a few close calls years and years ago, but uh, it's actually pretty safe. I mean, airliners fly up in the higher altitudes with 150, 200 knot tailwinds all the time. The danger for us is actually the side loads. So as we go in, the wind's coming from the side. So if it hits us a particular way, we can get a little wobbly, which is difficult. But usually it's pretty safe, actually. All right, last question before I let you move on is, yes. do you have a fuzzy plane? We do not have a fuzzy plane yet, but whenever we get a new airplane and there's one coming, make sure you keep that idea because we might look out for, uh, for someone else to name it, not us. So, People are wondering why they're named after the Muppets. So if you oh want to answer that, or you can leave that as a mystery, but it's I back will, to you. I will answer that in a few slides. Let's get through this, and then I will answer that because it's a fun story. Uh, just remind me if I start to forget. All right, so flying laboratory. This is our flying laboratory right here. I'm going to use my cursor. This is the top 
and we're looking at the P3 from the top right, you can see that tell Doppler radar right there. And then this big long thing right here is like a pitot tube and it sticks away from the aircraft so that we don't disrupt the flow. So as an airplane goes through the air, the air moves around the airplane and it disrupts it. So we wanna get a good measurement. So we stick it way far out in front of the airplane at about 12 feet almost uh, in front of the airplane so we can actually read what's going on. And these engines are actually the same engines that are used on the Air Force Hurricane Hunter C-130s but they use their engines upside down and we don't know why. From here, you can actually see this big peanut or m and I keep calling it a peanut, peanut m and uh, down here. That is actually one of our radars as well that we can face to look wherever we need to. Over here, you can see that long nose on the G4. And then on the tail, you can see another tail Doppler radar. Over here is called station five. This is actually where we drop these drop signs out of. And that's a hand fed tube. So we can actually drop them by hand or we can preload the tubes, already have them calculated and ready with the computer, and then whenever he uh, hits the button, or whoever's sitting there at station five hits the button, it'll actually suck that, uh, that drop sign out, and it floats down by parachute. You'll see that here in just a minute as well. And then over here, we are looking at the inside of the G4. So these are some of the scientific racks. There's two of our meteorologists that are collecting data as they fly, and you can see the flight deck way up there in the front. Over here is actually James, one of our meteorologists, and he's sitting at his station. You can kind of see what he's looking at as far as those, the radar and pictures and data is concerned. So what does it look like? Well, this is what it looks like whenever you're inside of a storm. So other than bumping around and trying to hold your cookies down, uh, this is our nose radar. So this actually pans back and forth and we're able to actually sense what is in front of us without having to see it. Our tell Doppler radar, radar that TDR, is actually cutting the storm horizontally. And then the MMR is actually looking in a horizontal direction. So we can get that good 3D scope of what we're looking at. Up here in the top right, we actually have the G4 nose radar. So that's pretty cool to see. It's a different computer system, as you can see. And then down here in the bottom right, this is actually our flight director. And you'll see their station here in just a minute whenever we walk through the P3. And you can see just how crazy these data readouts are. We can really understand a lot about these storms uh, just by going in them and collecting their data. And you can see they have a forward looking and an MMR uh, radar that are down there. All right, now let's take you on a hurricane flight. So this is from inside, that's where the beds are right there. So Theodore, we got them right there. That's our station five, where we, or excuse me, where we actually drop the drop signs. And as we go through, you can see all of the different people working at their stations, all of their computers and radar screens and wind velocity screens. We're trying to see everything we can. As we come up here, we come into the forward half of the airplane, which is the flight deck. So over there on the left is actually gonna be the flight director station, the one we just talked about. And then on the, the right over here is actually the navigator. So we do still carry a navigator. As we go into the cockpit, you can see just how big it is. That gentleman standing there is about six foot tall. So we got a pretty good amount of room. Now, whenever we do fly, the pilot on the left is the pilot flying. The pilot on the right is the aircraft commander and he's communicating with the flight director. The gentleman in the, in the middle is actually our flight engineer. And all he's really doing is messing with the engines the entire time. And that's because we're trying to maintain 220 knots as we're going through that storm. So it's very important to be able to maintain that good, um, that good speed in order to keep us flying. Give me just a moment. I'm gonna switch our videos here. And let's see Nick Underwood. He's gonna tell us about a drop song. While you're switching that, Kenneth, can I ask yes. you a quick question that came in from Allison Paul? Um, Go ahead. Why do you take the meteorologist with you on the plane and not just send them information back on land? That is a very good question. The same reason that you take the rest of your soccer team with you whenever you go play soccer, because you want the rest of your team right there with you, collecting data and being involved. As soon as they see it, they can react. So if they're seeing something weird or something that's intensifying, they're able to make a call immediately to say, oh, this is happening. And they can call back to the hurricane center in Miami and say, hey, we're seeing some weird changes out here. So that's why we take our team with us. 
Great. All right, and we're just going to switch it up here video wise. These are really good questions. One of y'all has to be working for NOAA and you're just not telling them. Hi, my name is Nick Underwood here at NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center inside of our calibration lab. And today we're going to talk about our GPS drop sonds. Think of these like weather balloons in reverse. So as we're flying around through hurricanes, we're launching these from the aircraft to collect all sorts of important atmospheric data. Once these leave the aircraft, they have a small parachute that deploys to slow them down and keep them stable. And as they're falling, this instrument on the end is collecting pressure, temperature, and humidity data for us. And inside, there's a GPS receiver that is getting the wind speed and wind direction for us. And there's a radio transmitter that is sending all of that data back to the aircraft in real time so that we can get that data to the National Hurricane Center as quickly as possible. All right, very cool. So that gives you an idea of what those drop signs look like whenever we are throwing them out the backside of the airplane. And oh, thank you. This is what it looks like. So it's this little tube, it's about the size of a Pringles can. And you can see right here, we can hook it into the computer to give whatever information we want. And then it has its parachute right here that we load up. And this parachute is tied to this little string. The string hooks to the airplane. And as it gets pulled out, it drops down. And then we're able to sense the data right there. So very cool. All right. Now let's take a look at our hanger here. So this is the outside of our hanger. It's a massive hanger. We have over 250,000 square foot of space within our entire facility. That door is three stories tall and three school buses nose to tell wide. That huge blue water tank you just saw, that is for our fire suppression system. We're on a very large airport, about 1,400 acres. And you can see those big red boxes up there at the top. That is actually part of our fire suppression system. We don't defuel our airplanes when we put them in the hangar. So having a fire suppression system ensures that if there was a fire of any type, that that entire hangar could fill up with foam, expanding foam, to put out the fire in roughly about five minutes. So it actually works pretty quick. Up there in the top left, you can see our huge davit crane, and that's so we can bring those engines off of the uh, airplanes. Those of you in the Midwest might recognize that beautiful green machine right there in front of the Twin Otter. That's our John Deere. You can see that P3 is cordoned off. One of the engines is on the ground. There's some propellers in the back. And then we have our King Air and that beautiful Twin Otter. And the Twin Otter is actually going through what's called an EMA, or a phase maintenance cycle. And that's important because of how much we fly, we can break that up into different uh, phases. Uh, you can see it's uh, ailerons and flaps actually move. And that's because we're a stole airplane, or short takeoff and landing. And so that allows us to actually take off in a shorter distance and also to land in a shorter distance. So it's a very, very capable airplane. So before we get into questions, you ask why do we call them what we call them? So Miss Piggy was known as the pig. And at the time, the chief of maintenance was uh, not the cleanest individual you might meet. The plane was always dirty. The inside was always full of trash and things like that. He didn't really clean it up that, that, that good. So they called it the pig. Well, this new chief comes in and it's his plane now. And well, the name was stuck. It was called the pig. But he said, well, what is the most beautiful, most clean pig that I know? And it was around the 80s, so the Muppets were huge. And he said, Miss Piggy. And Miss Piggy stuck. And you can't have one plane named Miss Piggy without her boyfriend Kermit being there. So now we have Kermit and Miss Piggy. And now we have Gonzo as well. So that's that uh, story. It's always really fun. Now, what questions do you have? And I'm just going to remind people that we're going for Fozzie too. I'll put the plug in for Fozzie coming up. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to write that down. 
So another question for you, and then I have a question for both of you that came in. So one of the questions that came in, and actually two uh, different viewers asked the same question. They were wondering why, um, so Bodhi and Rebecca, why don't you defuel the planes in the hangar? That is a very, very good question. A very intelligent question. So sometimes we get back very late at night and sometimes we have to leave early in the morning and we don't always have the opportunity. It would take about an hour or more to defuel one of our planes. And to prevent that time, that changeover, we could put the airplane inside of a secure hangar that has a fire suppression system, so it's protected, and keep it safe while the other crew comes on board uh, and is able to pre-flight and do the things that they need to do while it's in the hangar and they're safe. Um, so that's why we don't defuel. It saves us a lot of time. Great, and this is a question that always comes from our regulars, so I'm always glad to ask it. And either one of you can take it first, but what is your favorite part of your job? Oh my, I'm gonna let Jonathan take that one before me. Well, uh, one of my favorite parts is is getting to tell all the things that NOAA does. Uh, it's, it's really cool working with the aircraft side now because we do missions for so many parts of NOAA, whether it's the fisheries service, the weather service, uh, the satellite service, um, even the ocean service with the coastal mapping. So that was a question about why do we map the coast? It's very important to establish our, our nautical baseline uh, for what part of the ocean is technically ours. Um, so I, I really enjoy it. And, and just getting the chance to do these types of talks where I get to hear from, hear from you all as well, really makes my day. Excellent. And how about you, Kenneth? Well, I would have to say I have two kind of sides of my job. So I'm the public affairs officer and I'm a pilot. So as a pilot, I absolutely love seeing the United States. I get to go everywhere around the United States. I get to see the countries uh, or the parts of the country that nobody else get to, gets to see. You know, we're up in Bangor, Maine, and I'm looking at the beautiful lobster pods and fishermen out at sea searching for whales. And then I go inside and I get to see all of the beautiful Midwest and then the Rocky Mountains and Alaska. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. We have an amazing country. And not only that, I get to see the effect that I'm directly having on science. So I get to work with those biologists and they can say, hey, we finally found this pot of wells that we've been looking for for years and we found them. Um, and we can see uh, how the snow might melt and create flooding. And so I know that I'm helping people in emergency response to protect their farms and protect their small uh, communities. And then as a PAO, I absolutely love sharing the story of NOAA and being able to talk to young people like you and get you inspired to get in the STEM fields and go and work for us as either a pilot or a meteorologist or a biologist. So those are the two parts that I absolutely love about my job. I have to say you both mentioned that my favorite part of my job is getting to share what the amazing things that you all do. So I would third that, that it's really fun to share the science that everyone's doing. Um, so this question I think is for Kenneth. And this question comes from Grace. What was the coolest flight you ever took for NOAA? Grace, good question. So I was actually on the flight with Hurricane Dorian, um, and that was last year. And while I was in the actual storm, we went from a Category 4 to a Category 5. Now, mind you, I left work at about 9 o'clock that night because I was working a little bit, and I slept, and I got a phone call. And they said, hey, do you want to go on this flight? And I said, absolutely, I want to go on this flight. This is what I joined for. And so I got on it, and I was able to watch the sunrise over the Bahamas. And as we slowly approached the Bahamas, that storm cloud started creeping in on us. And we broke into the hurricane, and we spent quite a few hours in there, about four hours. And we were able to predict that that storm was going to slow down and intensify. And the data that we collected actually went immediately to the people in the Bahamas, and they were able to protect themselves. Uh, from that storm that was increasing. And as we broke out, there was just a sense of camaraderie in the plane and that we we truly did something great. And it was really, really cool to watch the sunrise over those beautiful islands right before that crazy storm came to to really to damage a lot of that a, a lot of those people's uh, property. And then knowing that we protected a lot of that with just the sheer data that we were able to collect. I think that's the coolest moment I've ever had flying. Excellent. And this question is for you, Jonathan. And there, um, folks are wondering if you fly. Do you ever get to go up in the planes? Do you ever fly? 
Um, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I occasionally get a chance to fly. Um, my one flight in the P3 was in the tropical storm Barry uh, that became Hurricane Barry briefly, but nobody ever really goes to New Orleans to get their life together. So Barry just sort of fell apart as, as it was coming into New Orleans uh, in 2019. But um, I, I love New Orleans, by the way. Sorry for any New Orleans. Um, but yeah, I and I I love getting a chance to tell the story. Sometimes I get, I get to bum a ride, but uh, usually I'm flying the desk uh, back here, just uh, sharing the pictures. And uh, Kenneth was talking about becoming a NOAA Corps officer. So you know, when you go through college, you get a STEM degree, you can apply to our basic officer training course, and they, you know, you get to be a NOAA a sailor uh, on our ships, or else you can get picked up for the flight program. And you don't always need prior experience. Uh, there, there is a training pipeline as well. Great. All right. Well, I just want to be aware of time. Um, we're, we're close to the end. So I just want to say thank you, first of all, to Kenneth and Jonathan. Super, super interesting tour. I knew it was going to be really fun to go behind the scenes. Thank you to our ASL, our American Sign Language interpreters. We're always so glad to have you with us. And um, yeah, just thanks for sharing your expertise and taking us taking us where we've never been before. A reminder to all of our viewers, some people asked about the recordings. It will be recorded and it will be posted on our NOAA Live for Kids website. We also already have some videos that Jonathan and Kenneth gave us that are some tours of some of those planes. So I encourage you to go take a look at those. They're really interesting. And um, for next week, I always like to give you a quick plug for what we're gonna be doing next week. We're gonna be going to the Connecticut coastline and talking about kelp farming. So really, really interesting. Um, you can learn all about kelp farming um, with us at our NOAA Live next Wednesday, four o'clock, same place, same time. So this is the officially the last of our open house. We will continue our NOAA Live series, go back to that, but our month of March was open house uh, month. And so thanks again. I can't think of a better way for us to end our open house series, but to fly away into the sunset. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week and have a great night. Or if you're on the other coast, have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you.